Welcome everyone to Christmas Eve here at Piedmont Community Church. We're so glad you've joined with us. We're all together online this year, which none of us expected to be, but here we are in God's house to welcome the coming of Christ. So let's do that together. And let's join together now in the call to worship that you'll see printed on the screen. We gather this night to share good tidings of great joy. Today in the town of Bethlehem, a Savior has been born to us. He is Christ the Lord. With the angels, let us sing our praises. Glory to God in the highest, and on earth peace to all on whom God's favor rests. Let's join together now in a time of prayer. God of grace and God of glory, we come together tonight with thankful, expectant hearts, for Christ is born. We come before you with awe for the revelation of yourself in the babe in a manger. For in him you were born of flesh, that we might be born of spirit. In him you gave us one to share our humanity and reveal your will. In him, you gave us a model of complete trust in you, even in times of testing, rejection, suffering, and despair. In him, you gave us a companion on our journey in life so that we can experience the hope and the reality of salvation. So may our lives reflect with gratitude the light of your love given to us in your Son. Yet even where there's light, holy God, there's still shadow. So when grief and fear and illness, disappointment, loneliness come, when candlelight does not seem sufficient to light our way, fill us with a peace only you can bring. For the Christ child came not only to redeem the world, but to walk beside each of us and all of us in times of distress. So right now, we pray that his presence will bring healing and hope to those who grieve, those who are sick, those who are poor or hungry or depressed or oppressed. 
And in a moment of silence, we pray for all those for whom we have special concern this evening. Merciful God, as we come to the still center of the Christmas season, guide us now to pause and remember the true meaning of this night. For you who gave us everything we have, have blessed us with the greatest gift of all, your Son. So rekindle within us the ability and the will to bow before you with trust and the innocence of a small child, so that whatever we feel tonight at, at Jesus' birth will remain with us throughout the year, the hope and the expectation of new life. For we pray this in the name of Jesus the Christ, who teaches us all to pray together with one voice, saying, Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread. Forgive us our debts as we forgive our debtors. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever. Amen. Welcome to the Christmas Eve service. Merry Christmas from the Quants family, John, Allison, Leslie, and Melissa. During the Advent season, we light four candles representing hope, peace, joy, and love as we prepare for the coming of Christ. Tonight, we light the Christ candle in the middle to remind us that Jesus, the light of the world, was born this night in the city of David. As the prophet said, the people who walked in darkness have seen a great light. For unto us a child is born, unto us a son is given. His name shall be called Wonderful Counselor, Mighty God, Everlasting Father, Prince of Peace. He is also called Emmanuel, for in him God is with us. And so we light this candle to remind us that Christ is born unto us and to the whole world on this holy night. God has made this night holy by the gift of a child, born of the Holy Spirit and of Mary. Upon him rested all God's grace. Through him has come all of God's mercy. So let his light shine within our hearts right now even more brightly than it shines from the candle in this place. The people who walked in darkness have seen a great light. Those who lived in a land of deep darkness on them light has shined. For a child has been born for us, a son given to us. Authority rests upon his shoulders, and he is named Wonderful Counselor, Mightiful God, Everlasting Father, Prince of Peace. His authority shall grow continually, and there shall be endless peace for the throne of David and his kingdom. He will establish and uphold it with justice and with righteousness, from this time onward and forevermore. The zeal of this Lord of hosts will do this. Oh. 
month, the angel Gabriel was sent by God to a town in Galilee called Nazareth, to a virgin engaged to a man whose name was Joseph of the house of David. The virgin's name was Mary, and he came to her and said, Greetings, favored one, the Lord is with you. But she was much perplexed by his words and pondered what sort of greeting this might be. The angel said to her, Do not be afraid, Mary, for you have have found favor with God, and now you will conceive in your womb and bear a son, and you will name him Jesus. He will be great and will be called the Son of the Most High, and the Lord God will give to him the throne of his ancestor David. He will reign over the house of Jacob forever, and of his kingdom there will be no end. Then Mary said, Here I am, the servant of the Lord, let it be with me according to your word. Then the angel departed from her. Oh, night divine. 
In the time of King Herod, after Jesus was born in Bethlehem of Judea, wise men from the east came to Jerusalem asking, Where is the child who has been born King of the Jews? For we observed his star at its rising, and have come to pay him homage. Then Herod secretly called for the wise men and learned from them the exact time when the star had appeared. Then he sent them to Bethlehem, saying, Go and search diligently for the child, and when you have found him, Bring me word, so that I may also go and pay him homage. When they had heard the king, they set out, and there, ahead of them, went the star that they had seen at its rising, until it stopped over the place where the child was. When they saw that the star had stopped, they were overwhelmed with joy. On entering the house, they saw the child with Mary, his mother, and they knelt down and paid him homage. Then, opening their treasure chests, they offered him gifts of gold, frankincense, and myrrh. Thank you. 
In those days, a decree went out from Emperor Augustus that all the world should be registered. This was the first registration and was taken while Quirinius was governor of Syria. All went to their own towns to be registered. Joseph also went from the town of Nazareth in Galilee to Judea, to the city of David called Bethlehem, because he was descended from the house and family of David. He went to be registered with Mary, to whom he was engaged and who was expecting a child. While they were there, the time for her to deliver the child came. And she gave birth to her firstborn son and wrapped him in bands of cloth and laid him in a manger, because there was no place for them in the inn. In that region, there were shepherds living in the fields, keeping watch over their flock by night. Then an angel of the Lord stood before them, and the glory of the Lord shone around them, and they were terrified. But the angel said to them, Do not be afraid, for see, I am bringing you good news of great joy for all people. To you is born this day in the city of David a Savior, who is the Messiah, the Lord. This will be a sign for you. You will find a child wrapped in bands of cloth and lying in a manger. And suddenly there was with the angel a multitude of heavenly hosts, praising God and saying, Glory to God in the highest heaven, and on earth peace among them, those whom he favors. When the angel had left them and gone into heaven, the shepherds said to one another, Let us go now to Bethlehem and see this thing that has taken place, which the Lord has made known to us. So they went with haste and found Mary and Joseph and the child lying in the manger. Well, Merry Christmas. Although it's not quite the same as gathering in this beautiful sanctuary and uh, being together, I am so grateful for this wonderful technology that we have that still allows us to gather and to celebrate on this most magical of nights as we celebrate the birth of our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. If there is one truth that has been affirmed during this pandemic, it is this. We are created for relationship, relationship with God and with God's people. And it seems like as we have now been in this strange season for almost two years, we are all really yearning to be together, to, for life to return to normal so that we can be with loved ones and not worry about masks and tests and all the rest. And we understand that as a pastoral staff, as a church, we feel it ourselves. And that, that is why it was so difficult to make, for us to make this decision to have only online services tonight. But it came down to doing what is best for the safety and the health of you and of us and our community. So I hope you understand. But Merry Christmas, we can still celebrate. Let's pray together to begin. God, we thank you for this beautiful night to celebrate the birth of your son, Jesus Christ. Thank you that right at the heart of this celebration is your great love for us that seeks after us, even to the point that you sent your son into the pain and brokenness of this world so we could see this love incarnate. God, we pray that on this night, you will remind us again of this perfect love that changes our lives, giving us peace and joy and hope. Amen. Well, my guess is that many of us, many of you, have traveled great distances over the last few days to be together with loved ones, to be home for the holidays. It's truly amazing that even during a worldwide pandemic, we will rush through crowded airports and endure security checks and sit in a steel tube at 30,000 feet for hours to be with loved ones, to be at home. An article in the US News and World Report said that for all our moving around, on average, once every five years, most of us still have in our minds and in our hearts a place called home that remains the gravitational pull center of our lives. And, as the article went on, 
Every holiday, we feel its emotional pull drawing us back. Home is a very evocative word, don't you think? I can't think of a more evocative word. A powerful word, isn't it? The idea of home can make us smile or cry. It can give us a sense of peace or it can make us anxious. This idea of home, it it touches a deep part of the human heart, doesn't it? Especially around the holidays. Perhaps that is why so many holiday songs have to do with home. But there is one song about home that stands out above all the rest, isn't there? Now, if you haven't been with us here at Piedmont Community Church during the Advent season, let me catch you up a bit. We are uh, at the end now of this sermon series we have called Songs of the Season. And every week we have taken a popular holiday song. Not a hymn or a religious song, but a secular song, a popular song. And we have explored how that song really contains within it some deep human yearnings. We've looked at Santa Claus is coming to town, the most wonderful time of the year, the Christmas song, and Rudolph the Red-Nosed Reindeer. And each time, the preacher has led the congregation in at least a verse or two of that song. I gotta say, for those who of you who have been here on Sundays, you have uh, been good sports and you have sung along as we uh, sang this song. Now, of course, tonight I'll be singing alone in the sanctuary unless Michael Barber or Don Ashburn, our associate uh, pastor who happens to be here, sings along. So it's going to be a solo. I'll give it my best shot and bear with me. You know what song I'm talking about, don't you? I'll be home for Christmas. You can count on me. Please have snow and mistletoe and presents under the tree. Christmas Eve will find me where the love life gleams. I'll be home for Christmas, if only in my dreams. You know that song, but do you know the story behind it? It was written in 1943, right in the middle of World War II, and it was written from the viewpoint of a soldier out in the battlefield somewhere far away, dreaming of being home for Christmas. It was extremely popular here in the United States, but here's something you may not know. It was banned in Britain because the government thought it would hurt the morale of troops who wouldn't be home for Christmas. There's no doubt that U.S. News and World Report is right. There is a strong emotional pull, yearning, that draws us back home for Christmas. But here's the question I want to explore tonight. What is this pull? And what is this this yearning for home? What is this place we call home? Have you ever thought about that? What is home? And why is the mention of home able to conjure up in us so many emotions in our hearts? Well, I've given it some thought, and let me give you some of my ideas and see what you think. Home can be a place. It can definitely have something to do with geography. We can certainly associate home with with certain smells or weather or scenery. I I remember when my wife and I lived in New Jersey for three years when I was in seminary. 
New Jersey, you know, it's an okay place. Actually, I think it gets kind of a bum, bum rap, and I don't want to offend anyone who calls New Jersey home. But when you're from California, when you're native Californians, New Jersey, well, it's just not home. And I remember coming home one summer for a break, and we drove some from the Bay Area down to Los Angeles to see my family. And as we drove through uh, the beautiful state that we all live in, I remember thinking, ah, oh, this, this is home. You know, the dry heat, the warm sun on my arms, the, the open spaces of the West, the certain smells, the, the oaks on the rolling hills, or the ocean, or the redwoods. It's just home. Place can definitely contribute to this feeling of home, but I don't think it's essential. Do you? See, I think home really has much more to do with relationships, with being with those who know us well, who have loved us for a long time and have seen us at our best and our worst and still love us. Home is that one place where you can be yourself and you are welcomed and accepted and even celebrated just for being you. Robert Frost wrote a great poem entitled The Hired Man, Hired Man about a husband and wife who argue about whether to take in this kind of old sort of cranky, troublesome acquaintance who is dying and has no place else to go. The husband doesn't want to take him in, and the wife thinks they should. There are some great lines in this poem about home. The husband says this, he says, home is the place where when you go there, they have to take you in. (laughs) The wife disagrees. She says, I should have called it something you somehow haven't to deserve. I like both of those. but I especially like the second one. Home is a place you don't deserve. In that way, it is very much a place of grace where you are loved unconditionally. It seems to me that love is definitely at the heart of home, as is security and stability. There are also parts of home. In this world that is changing so rapidly and oftentimes seems so unstable, where nothing ever seems to stay the same, it's nice to come home, isn't it? And know that some things never change. It's assuring to know that some traditions will always remain the same no matter what. Now, if you don't think this is important, just listen to some newlyweds as they try to create some of their own holiday traditions. Some of the biggest challenges in the first year of marriage can revolve around whether to open presents in the morning or at night. Ham or turkey, tamales or beef tenderloin, security belonging, loving relationships, stability, warmth, consistency, constancy. These are the things that make up home. And these are the things that we yearn for, and these are the things that songwriters have romanticized when they write about going home for Christmas. Well, it's a great picture, isn't it? And I guess that this picture could be reality for many of us, for some people. But unless I'm mistaken, for many of us, going home or thinking of home isn't quite the perfect picture that many of these songs paint. For some of us, home is not always like it's cracked up to be in many of the songs that we sing at Christmas. In the real world, in the world in which many of us live, loved ones die or leave, marriages fall apart, people move, friends become estranged or grow apart. No, in the real world, many Christmases 
do not give us all that I just talked about, this love and belonging and security or sta stability. For many of us, Christmas can remind us of painful memories or make us aware that another year has passed and we do not have the home that we have always hoped for. Well, can I say something very gently and lovingly to you tonight? I don't think we will ever completely find the home that all of us yearn for unless we find our home in God. There will always be a bit of disappointment or a little pain in all of our human relationships. There will always be a yearning in our hearts for a place called home. And you see, I think that God has put that yearning in our hearts to gently remind us that we are not at home until we find our home in God. Barbara Brown Taylor, a theologian, writer, Presbyterian pastor, or congregational pastor, has said this. She said, homesickness is God's tug at our hearts, a kind of homing instinct planted in each of us. In other words, God is our home. God is our home. And we will always experience a bit of homesickness or yearning or an ache in our heart until we find our home in God. Let me ask you, do you ever feel that ache? You know, it's beneath the surface of everyone's life. And it won't go away until we find our home in God. This, this yearning, this ache can be ignored. It can be disguised, mislabeled, or submerged in a tor torrent of busyness and activity. But it won't disappear. God has, has put it there in our hearts to remind us to come home to our true home. Ironically, as I was thinking about it this week, our home, true home, is found in this little Christ child, homeless child, born 2,000 years ago. For it is in this relationship with Christ that we find the grace, the love, the true belonging and stability that we all long for. God is our home. And it is through the aches that God reminds us to come home to him. For that is where we will find the inner joy and peace and love that are not of this world. It's in God that we find a sense of belonging, that we're secure. You know, it's interesting, over the years, as I've been a pastor, I have had so many people remark to me after they've been coming to our church for a while, whatever church it may be, that they feel like it feels like home. And I think that, you know, a building can remind us perhaps of a, a home that we, a church that we grew up with and have been away from or somehow reminds us of home. But some of these per people never went to a church. And yet this is how they describe it as they come. I feel like I'm home. And here's the good news today. That no matter what happens in life, through all the ups and downs and the losses, the disappointments, the changes that all of us experience, our faith in Christ is constant. Our home never leaves. It can give us the security and love and sense of belonging that every heart desires. You know, the idea of God being our home is definitely a major theme in the Bible. You know, we see it right from the beginning. Adam and, and Eve yearned for paradise after they were banished from the Garden of Eden. Abraham left his home in order to find a promised land that the Lord 
Lord pledged to give to him. And the exiled Hebrews, oh, they longed, they yearned for Palestine while they languished in exile in Babylon. And the prodigal son returned home to his father's house. Now, you probably know the story of the prodigal son. It's, it's the most famous of all the parables of Jesus. And I think this is where we find a beautiful picture of home. And I want to close with this. Jesus said at the beginning of the parable that God is like a father who has two sons. And the younger son is sick of life on the farm. He's dreaming of greener pastures, sick of being with the father. And so he tells his dad he wants his share of the inheritance and to allow him to go. And shockingly, the father consents to both requests. And the son runs off to greener pastures, so he thought. And living lavishly and foolishly, he goes through the money in no time, leaving him destitute and broken. And finally, he comes to his senses, and he eats some humble pie, and he begins a long journey home. And the father has been waiting, scanning the horizon every day, looking for his son. And he sees him walking toward the road, toward the farmhouse, and begins running toward him. And when they meet, he doesn't scold him or punish him or reject him in any way. No, when they meet, he embraces his broken son. And he envelops him with an embrace and smothers him with kisses. Wow, that is a beautiful picture of home, isn't it? I think it's the most beautiful picture in the entire Bible. This, folks, is our home. This is our true home, our eternal home. We are at home when we in live in the embrace and the love of God, rest in that perfect love, and enjoy communion with God. That is home. Amen. Let's pray together. God, we thank you that we can find our true home in you, in your perfect love. We thank you that this love is unconditional, that it is constant, that it loves us for who we are, and that nothing can separate us from this love. Lord, for someone who has experienced this ache, but not your love, and hasn't been at home with you, I I pray that this Christmas is when they will come home. Or for those who have wandered off, Lord, help them to return to your love. God, I pray that for all of us, this Christmas may be a time when we enjoy communion with you and find our home in your embrace. Amen. Tonight we're going to take a a Christmas offering. And personally, I just feel so, uh, like this offering is so important that we wanted it included in tonight's video service. We're going to show you a video that kind of explains why we're taking this offering and and who's going to receive the money that you give to this offering. All the money that is collected tonight and online over these next few days will go directly to this mission partner of ours. The mission partner is First Hispanic Church of Oakland. It is a church in East Oakland, actually just a few miles from here who has started a feeding program uh, as this church looked around its neighborhood, primarily Hispanic neighborhood, Central American uh, refugees. They they saw very quickly that people were really hurting because of the pandemic. Um, Many of these folks work in low wage jobs that that are not either available at this time or very dangerous to work during a pandemic. I just read an article this morning in uh, the news that said that this is the 
population, the specific population, Latino workers who are working low wage job, jobs who are gonna be hit hardest by this pandemic. So we wanna take this money and we wanna bless this church and this neighborhood uh, and help people who are really hurting, uh, who have been hurting for 18 months and now are going to really feel the pain of this pandemic again. So we're gonna show this video. It will explain uh, the ministry that we're giving to. And then at the end, you can uh, go online. The, it'll be very clear where you can go to make a donation. So friends, let us give in the season of giving where we have been given so much. Let us be generous in uh, the giving of, of our money to this great cause. pasa que yo pertenezco, a, soy miembro de la primera iglesia presbiteriana hispana de aquí de Oakland y pertenezco al, a, soy la moderadora del grupo de diáconos y entonces eh, nuestro trabajo es eso, ¿no? Eh, ayudar a las personas y, y se nos fue asign, asignando estas labores, eh, pero esto por esto de la pandemia pues este, ah, muchas personas no querían trabajar y entonces empezamos con los voluntarios. Siempre ah, a mí me gusta es, ayudar, ¿no? Ayudar y, y pues empezamos, eh, la idea vino del pastor, de poder dar comida a las personas y, y pues empezaron con 20 personas, con 20 ah, despensas, bolsitas de despensas y y que fueron donadas. Esto fue una donación de una iglesia. Después eh, donaron un poco de, de, de dinero, también las iglesias o otras organizaciones. Y fuimos, antes nosotros comprábamos la comida eh, por mayoreo y, y hacíamos bolsitas. Entonces fue creciendo de 20 a 50 y después de 50 a, a, a 60. Y, pero ahora atendemos, uh, hemos atendido, no que estemos atendiendo a todas estas personas, pero hasta ahorita hemos atendido hasta 500 personas. Y estaba viendo, haciendo mis apuntes y llevamos más de 5,000 despensas repartidas hasta el momento. Uh, de pandemia, a nosotros nos dio el COVID en diciembre, a toda mi familia pero no recibimos este, comida del condado ni nada, nada más mi familia, mis hermanos, ellos me llevaron comida. Y después, como la doctora de él se dio cuenta, nos mandaban comida caliente por dos semanas, dos veces a la semana. No, yo nada más a mí un día, yo pasé y me dieron comida, me dieron y me dijeron dame el número y me hablan cada 15 días. Yo soy, uh, soy creyente católica, yo voy a otra iglesia, pero en esa iglesia también dan comida, pero a veces hay como 300, 200 personas donde van. Um, en primer lugar, pues este programa significa mucho, porque aquí, uh, gracias a Dios, ayudan con despensas, frutas, verduras, uh, entre otras cosas que nos sirve para la cocina. Y pues para mí, para alguien como yo, que yo no trabajo, solo uh -huh. mi esposo. Y, entonces estoy muy agradecida con ellos porque están ayudando y ojalá que sigan ayudando más porque sí a mí me beneficia mucho ya es un, un, un ahorro en la casa no um, comprar alimentos. Gracias a ustedes y gracias porque yo sé que esto lo están haciendo por, por tratar de ayudar a la iglesia. Y estas ayudas se hacen porque um, habemos personas que, que no tenemos esos medios para poder este, sobrevivir, ¿no? Y que personas que están sufriendo. Thank you. 
Hay muchas, muchas cosas. Sí, mucha necesidad. O sea, no, no solamente es así como de comida, sino de muchas, de, de, hay muchas, de, de muchas formas de necesidad. Thank you. 